Hello and welcome to the Not So Alpha Males podcast, the show where every other Thursday, two cool nerds delve into the worlds of science, psychology, and pretty much everything in between. Uh, brought to you by your hosts, me, Tom. And me, Toby. Uh, and today, I'm going to be talking to you about bees, you know, the humble bumblebee and what they bring to mankind, which is quite of a lot. So stay tuned for that. And uh, what are you bringing to the table this week, Tobes? So today I'm going to be talking about plastic um, and the war on plastic. Is it what we think it is? Where does our plastic go? It's, uh, yeah, eye opening. Very Ooh, eye-opening. Well, that does sound good. And uh, to make sure you don't miss any of the action going on here, Make sure you go on and check us out on Instagram. Go follow us where we drop all kinds of uh, posts and updates. You'll find us at Not So Alpha Males. And as always, we'll be drinking throughout this episode. So without further ado, what have you got for cocktails this week, Toby? So, Tom, I've gone for the Malibu Bay Breeze. Oh, Which is uh, very tropical. We've got some Malibu in there. And I think I'm actually maybe a little bit allergic to Malibu. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> how can you be allergic to Malibu? I don't know. One time I had it, I came out in a rash and my mum gave me a hay fever tablet. Can't remember what happened after that. And oh, wow. That sounds serious. Yeah, so she, she spiked me. But uh, yeah, so we'll, see, we'll see how this goes. Hopefully not as bad as that. OK, what well, about you? what about you? <laughs> this week, I've got an Irish cactus. Uh, I wasn't actually gonna do this i had some other idea but i realized you need 24 hours to chill that drink before you drink it so kind of didn't plan my life very well so last minute an irish cactus which is you can probably imagine irish baileys cream liqueur with tequila so very simple <laughs> it, it, no it's quite nice That's it's essentially horrible. like a you know, it's basically baileys you're drinking baileys but with a bit more of a kick so it's two what's parts baileys it's what's the story behind this one I don't. I'm so sorry. I didn't bring a story this one. I know. I know. And I thought about that, but man, I've been up against it with the times this week. Okay. Not had time to do my usual in-depthness. So you'll have to take that and leave. Anyway, shall we get into the topics for this week? Let's do it. So bees, big topic. I also thought, you know, after last week's Topics are very, very intense, you know. That was a lot of brain power going in. So I thought we'd relax this week. And I think with the bees topics and your plastic topics, you know, chilled out listening. I think the audience will appreciate it. Yeah. So I'll start off with some facts then. I mean, did you know that there are 20,000 known species of bees in the world? I did not. 20,000. That's a lot, man. Yes, I've actually got the list here. So first, (laughs) do we have the Western honey bit? No. Um, <laughs> that's the that's the episode altogether. Uh, in the UK alone, we have 270 different species, which I think is kind of crazy. And these guys, they're found everywhere on the planet. Uh, every continent on the planet, you'll find bees, except for Antarctica. As you can imagine, there's no plants or anything on Antarctica. So, so Piri Reese uh, wouldn't have had to map that. <laughs> <laughs> We're really going for the strong connections to uh, past episodes, aren't we? So, yeah, bees are pollinators and they are the best, most efficient pollinators on the planet that we have. And actually, when I was looking back at the history of how plants evolved and bees evolved, uh, nature saw how good they were at pollinating. And so they evolved to provide the sweet nectar that bees have and make the honey with and things like that. So beforehand, you know, plants would try to pollinate with the winds and things like that. But then bees came along and started doing a much, much better job of it. And to reward them, plants then evolved this sweet nectar and like the smells and the pheromones that they all give off to attract more bees and obviously spread their seeds and spread their pollen a lot further. So I guess that's, you know, that's natural selection right there. Like yeah, the ones that yeah. did that ended up spreading a bit more. And yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So it, it's a, yeah, nature's always gone away. Nature's always gone away. So uh, yeah, so then the bees t- to respond to the nectar then evolves to get uh, hairier and hairier bodies to obviously carry more and more pollen. It, it was really interesting seeing how all over the time these different evolutions happened and do you have bees that aren't hairy because it's like too hot to be hairy uh wasps so bees came from wasps and wasps uh essentially can be looked at as hairless bees essentially <laughs> but um, so I'd be so, the wasp and you'd be so, the bee. 
<laughs> so yeah so wasps uh they do so wasps actually do pollinate and they do contribute to all the uh pollination cycles in the world but because they lack that hair and they lack specifically they're called pollen pouches which is basically this massive hair on the back leg so when a bee flies over to a flower and then it rubs it it's picking out the nectar because that's what it wants and then it's rubbing around the plant and it gets all the pollenoids back after the after it's been to a flower it will then use its uh, hind legs to push all that pollen that's been attached to its hair back to the back legs where these pouches are kept and they, they're not pouches I don't know why it's called pouches they're basically like this mound of really really sticky hair and that's where all the pollen collects and builds up it looks kind of disgusting on photos not gonna lie but <laughs> there's like a whole process for this thing man it's kind of crazy so yeah, no, wasps do pollinate, but because they haven't got all that hair, they aren't very good at it. So what I'll end up sort of getting to is that we can't depend on wasps for our pollination because they can't do it the same efficiency that a bumblebee can. They really have been, if they really have evolved to be the best at that. Are the bumblebees like the hairiest ones you get? Um, I actually don't know about different hairiness levels between bees. <laughs> Why do you not I didn't, I, this? I didn't go that far into it. Like, I mean... Yeah, sorry, I'm not bringing... Oh, this is a terrible episode now, I'm going to give up. I've not done my research. <laughs> I can't answer your questions. Probably, I imagine so. I imagine some are better than others. Um, what I can tell you, actually, is it's the Western honeybee, which is the most common place bee you'll find. So out of 20,000 species, this one makes up the biggest majority, and that's because they're the ones, hence the name honeybee, they're the ones that make the honey. So us humans have systematically domestically bred honeybees so that we can have the honey whilst they do actually all the pollination so when you're seeing bees out in public obviously you'll see the bumblebees they're quite big populations you know they're, they're really big fat ones that like quite cute and fluffy and bobble around in the air you have those and then the biggest one is the honeybee uh, which is the ones you'll see flying around all the plants constantly and uh, collecting all the nectar and pollen and doing all that good stuff Another interesting thing about bees is uh, this common misconception. I thought this was the case, apparently not, is bees don't die when they sting you. Like they're not meant to die when they sting you. Because I always remember being taught growing up, like, try not to let a bee sting you because then they die. And then obviously that's ruining the populations of bees. And it's actually down to the animal which they sting that kills them. And it depends on how tough the skin is on the animal so we humans actually have quite tough skin so when they sting us it's the stinger gets trapped and then it pulls out half the bee its intestines and muscles and nerves <laughs> it's really really graphic what i was reading man but that's the problem so like when it when it preys on its sort of natural um i say natural but when it preys on its sort of natural prey or f natural threats other insects the stingers just go in and out really easily and nothing happens. Bee carries on with its life. But when it comes into contact with like animals like us humans, that's when the myth, so to speak, comes into play and bees die because they sting you because they literally rip out half their insides when they're trying to get away <laughs> from the sting, which is really quite sad. So message of episode five, don't let bees sting you. Run away or something, I don't know. Just I yeah, mean, I do that all the time. I run and scream like a little girl and everyone laughs. Yeah, but that's... I'm saving the bees, mate. Saving yeah, but that's bees. in response to everything, though. That's not just bees. That's so... Yeah. But fair play. No, I, I see you doing your part. That's good. When I get yeah. to the end stuff, like, you'll feel really good about yourself. So fair yeah. enough. <laughs> Lastly, I was going to talk about was um, the buzzing sound. Because, you know, I could have a little bit of science in this episode, I thought. And I wanted to look into this a little bit. So, you know, that buzzy sound that they make? comes from the flapping frequency of their wings. So a bee can flap its wing at 230 beats per second. That's right. That's quite mental. Isn't there like a thing where bees physically shouldn't be able to fly, like bumblebees? I oh, I do like that. know of that. Like scientifically, they, yeah. they shouldn't really be able to fly. It's sort of do the aerodynamics and like the weight yeah. to wing ratio. It's just all wrong. It's yes, so somehow fat works. Tiny wings. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't go into that because I'm I'm looking I'm what I will be getting into is like the pollination cycles and how bees give us food and things like that and without them we'll go die. That's the kind of angle I'm coming from. I just thought but it was it was easy to get 
stuck on the bumblebee because they're just fat and fluffy and <laughs> do no harm to people. So, but yeah, 230 beats per second. And so, yeah, those rapid wing beats cause the air around the bee to vibrate. And that vibration travels through the air to your ear and then is interpreted as that buzzing sound. Yeah, so the buzzing sounds linked to each type of insects is to do with how quickly they can flap their the wings, frequency, essentially. Yeah. The frequency, yeah. Now, I do want to say, I didn't know this either. This is very fascinating to me. Most species of bees don't live in hives. And like in, you know, when you've got these hives of uh, bees and wasps and they all live together in thousands and thousands in a big beehive, that actually isn't the normality for bees. Most bee species live in like little family groups, like a pair, <laughs> mother and father, and then like things. And they can live in all <laughs> kinds of areas, which I thought was quite cute as well. <laughs> just you know, a little bee home. Just Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> wife and kids there and they just, yeah, they've got their day to day life and like they won't live in a big old hive. They just have like some might have little holes in the ground, some a little hole in the wall. like And they live kind of solid, solitary lives, which is kind of sad. I think that, in that a that big would be colony. Me if, I, if I was a bee, that would be me, I think. Yeah, I'm not into the big. Guy, I'd be there. <laughs> You're not really into the social interactions and stuff yeah. like that. No, fair enough. So species of bee, there's a couple I want to bring forward because they uh, warrant talking about, they warrant the publicity. First, we spoke a bit about it, the Western honeybee, also known as the European honeybee. And as I said, that's like the most common one found across the world uh, due to its honey production capabilities. So obviously beekeepers want that because rather than just being able to pollinate their plants and their crops and things like that, they also then get the honey side of things which is they can sell and make money on. And they make the honey um, with the nectar, right? Yeah, so that process is quite interesting. So the bees obviously are traveling around to different flowers, collecting the pollen, and then themselves are drinking the nectar of the flowers. And they have two stomachs, one where they store the nectar, to the, which be made into honey. And then the second stomach, which is like their food stomach, the, what, the nectar they'll use to actually grow themselves and things like that so they have like a whole separate stomach to store the good quality nectar to make honey for us <laughs> which is kind of cool why, why do they bother making the honey why do they not just eat the food? well i think they they use it as a food source for back of the hive because uh as i'll get into with like the heart the hive hierarchy different bees have different roles and some of them don't ever leave the hive so think about it as like they're going away to make to go get food and bring it back to the hive so that the others can eat, including the queen, the most important one, because she obviously never leaves the hive. So they have like a stomach for themselves for which them to eat and grow and get big and strong. And then also one to like take food back and then provide for the rest of the bees. But then unfortunately humans come along and scrape all the honey out. So, you know. <laughs> get really pissed off, I bet. We're, <laughs> we're a bit of a, we are a dick species, to be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Moving on, we have the European dark bee, uh, which is also no known as the German black bee. And these ones are absolute bitches because they will chase people to sting them without any provocation to <laughs> cause it. Like they, they are very aggressive. They are known as very, very aggressive bees and they don't need like a reason. They don't need a threat to their home or something like that to actually make them want to sting things. They just want to do it. Okay, so, do it. The, so stay away from the European dark bee. Uh, then you have the killer bee, quite a cool one, and that's a hybrid species that's come forward recently, well, I say recently, and it's a hybrid between the crossbreeding of African honeybees and European honeybees, uh, and this species is much more defensive than any of its sort of counterparts. It's known to attack humans, and when I was reading about it, you know what came to mind? Um, you know in the film Hunger Games, those tracker jacker wasp things that kill one of the contestants basically i'm imagining that when i'm listening to those <laughs> when i'm reading about killer bees don't, don't go they, near um, them isn't the fact that they're they're killer is because when they sting they sting as like a massive group yes it's yeah so sting kills you it's just like the thing thousands is thousands of them yeah the, the thing is that they coordinate themselves and they'll attack something individual uh, as, as a group they'll attack an individual as a group rather than the normal bees which if one gets you know pissed off or threatened threatened or whatever they'll sting but no one else will come to its aid whereas this one you'll get thousands of bees coming at you and stinging you and yeah there have been deaths 
from these bees. There's that rumour that, I don't know if it's true, you probably don't know either, but you know the thing <laughs> <you>. killing a bee? <laughs> it's like killing a wasp or killing a bee, or when it stings you, it lets off like some aroma, which then attracts the other ones. Oh, yeah. Well, I was going to touch on this. Like um, the pheromone network, the pheromone communication network of bees is the most complex system of pheromones in the natural world. Like they use it to obviously, I'll get into it in a little more detail later because it's really quite fascinating science. But the queen bee, which obviously controls everything that's going on in the hive and its workers and things like that, uses pheromones to control what everyone's doing. And it's quite amazing that they do it all through pheromones, obviously not having speech or things like that. Uh, but it's a very powerful communicator. And yeah, that's one of the things is um, when one dies, it can release t- uh, pheromones into the air which can be picked up and then they know to go to that area or to avoid that area and things like that so there's also bees do dances that's quite a big thing um (laughs) they do different dances to signify different things going on yeah they're they're very very talkative bees are yeah next time you see one have a chat have a chat with a nice bumblebee um (laughs) moving on then in lockdown mate if you just sit out the window (laughs) talk to me (laughs) bro i tried to tell you that last week my psyche was cracked okay the simulation theory (laughs) made me question everything so now you talk to bees now i talk to bees um next the bumblebee yeah the one that we always bring up um yes they have very round bodies and that's the other thing now that i'm actually reading my notes on it the hairs on them are soft compared to every other bee those are also the most friendliest type of bee. They won't really attack you ever. That's enough about species of bees. I hope you're going to talk to us about different types of plastic and bore our listeners that way because we've got a hell of a <laughs> hell of a show no, on the road. I thought I thought it would be best not to do that, but obviously you didn't get that. Uh, that <laughs> you didn't <moment>. tell me. <laughs> Fuck. Anyway, what I'm going to talk about now is all about the honeybee because that's obviously the biggest one, and they're the threat to our existence as well as the threats that are going on to their existence at the moment. So, first off, a bit of beehive hierarchy: how these guys talk, how these guys move, how these guys get around. You know, the serious stuff. You have three types of bee: the queen, the workers, and the drones. Don't know if you know any of this stuff already, or I know about the queen and the worker bees, but. Okay, sound. Right. So the queen is uh, just any old larva that was randomly selected at birth and then is fed more than any other larva to obviously grow the biggest and the strongest. And that one becomes the queen. And it's also allowed to sexually develop, which is a whole other kind of science to actually be able to lay more larvae and things like that. Wait, I'm I'm confused. Wait, so so all these larvae, the little eggs... Yeah. They just get fed by all the different bees and then the biggest one basically becomes a queen. Yeah, so um, obviously you've always got you've got a queen, but then when one queen dies, the pre-existing eggs that have already been laid in the larvae, the just out of randomness, the hive itself will, just out of pure numbers, statistics, one will get fed more than other, like one will get fed more than any other, and that one then grows to be the biggest. And it actually, when they get out of their little honeycomb structure, when they get big enough to become a proper bee, then they get out, they will actually eat and kill the other ones that are of similar strength. So you have one that's so above yeah. the rest that that's then the queen. So she's a real boss ass bitch, to be fair. Like, <laughs> she's killing she, it. How, how is it that she can have babies? Like, what if it's a him? Or is that not a thing? Like, no, just... that's so what you have is it will always be a female that becomes a queen because the main job of the queen is just to reproduce so there's not i don't think in that when the bees are like you know having their little meeting and working out which one to make queen i don't think a man really comes into the equation to be honest <laughs> like it doesn't fulfill the option so it's just not the, they the just grow and they the become the, they're just drones they just become drones and i think she has control over them because of this fer- pheromone network that i'll tell you about like she can control them through the pheromones that she releases but males just grow and become and they can become bigger and smaller obviously if they get fed more or less but males will always just become drone bees so you know how i said there's workers and there's drones the workers are all the females and the drones are all the males and the drones literally do nothing absolutely nothing apart from uh, fertilizing the queen over and over again <laughs> minute after minute and then she lays in it so at the height at the peak of her reproduction capabilities the queen will lay 1500 eggs per day 
and can she lay like the queen. And... <laughs> she's getting she is it. Getting it. <laughs> yeah, and over her life she'll lay millions and millions of eggs. Hence why you get like the colonies with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of bees. So yeah, no, the, the males don't do anything. They're quite pointless, really, apart from they are used to reproduce. It's the workers, which are the females. And these are the ones that actually clean the hive, look after the queen, protect the queen. They build the hive, you know, that honeycomb structure. And they will do all the flying out to flowers, collecting the nectar, collecting the... Like, they do all the grunt work. So hence the name workers. And then the males just sit in the, uh, sit in the hive all day, having goes on the queen which is kind of weird. <laughs> mate, mate, I wish I was a bee. <gasps> yeah. All right, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, what else about the queen? Because it's quite crazy what she can do. So, oh, the other thing about the workers, they are female, but what the queen does is secretes pheromones that affect female bees to make them not sexually develop any further. So they can't actually have babies themselves. So she remains the one dominant queen until she dies. So it's, you know, kind of a dictatorship in one way. So yeah. kind of crazy. So yeah, somehow she releases, you know, chemicals into the air, which then stunts the growth and stunts the sexual development of the workers. So they can't have any children themselves. I wonder why it's, why it's like that. Like in terms of survival of the fittest and natural selection, like yeah. why wouldn't they want, all the bees to then have loads of more bees and i don't know why is I don't it know. Structure well that works the best like obviously it does but i wonder yeah. why it does i mean i don't know i think i presume if a colony had two females the bees would be like i don't know what to follow i don't know what to do i think the, the colony and the structure would just break down going back to like the actual honey making thing so what humans get from it all uh i thought i spoke a bit about the two stomachs and then they bring the nectar back what then happens is, so when they've got that full load of nectar in the honey stomach, let's call it that, uh, they pass it back through their mouths, back to the worker bees that are back at the hive, cleaning and doing that things. And then essentially, bee after bee will chew through it over and over and over again. Uh, and, this, and it does it for about half an hour. And after half an hour, it's passed from bee by bee and it's done enough bees and enough uh, chewing that it's just been turned into honey. Uh, and then the bees store that in those honeycomb cells. And this is what's even more crazier. You know, beeswax. So honey, mm -hmm. so bees can make honey as well as wax. Uh, once they filled a nice little cell of the honeycomb structure, they'll then make a nice wax cap to protect it from the air and keep it nice and fresh and things like that. So then that's when the people, well, that's when humans come along and then scrape off the tops and then squeeze all the honey out. Kind of sad all that work for nothing so uh and then what's also amazing as well is the temperature control within the beehive structure itself so with all the chewing it heats up quite a bit so and then you get very very runny honey so what the what there's uh, some bees that have the task of sitting over the honey cells when they're uh finished and full and they'll beat their wings really fast to blow air and cool the honey down and then another one will come in and put the wax top on it's like a whole little company man <laughs> it's honestly like rolls know? royce <laughs> this is crazy how assembly know, line how do they know how to do that like i get you say the pheromones but like how is the queen just looking out and be like oh, need to cool that down or send out that smell she, she's up in the main office looking down on the down. on the workforce like oh i see b39's not doing a lot today bring into <laughs> my office i don't know yeah it's just it's just a part of the pheromones obviously and getting told what to do but just it's just na nature it actually is crazy it's like the, the b movie in real life <laughs> have you seen yeah. the b movie i haven't oh what you, I should have done, done that for the it. research i should have done that for the research <laughs> of this film but so well, that's like it that's scientific. like a little company yeah, no, it generally it generally is a little honey making company. So very fair play to them, you know, hats off when they deserved. Anyway, what's our relationship with bees? I'm not being <laughs> overdramatic when I say that mankind's future on this planet depends on the honeybee. Without the honeybee, we're gonna die, which is quite serious because their population has been hard. their population has been decreasing rapidly. Like it's a big problem. There's a lot of charities out there working to make it better and things like that. So looking at what we would not have without our bees, you wouldn't have coffee, no apples, peaches, 
watermelon. I could go, I've got a massive list in front of me. Honestly, there's so much. Blueberries, albums, grapes, strawberries, cucumbers, all sorts. And that's because, and it has been proved by many, many a study, one out of three meals made by humans is possible because of the honeybee. So the idea, if honeybees go extinct, it's because we no longer have food sources, so we go extinct. That's the big thing. Because either by directly their pollination of plants to plants and then us eating those plants, like, you know, the uh, apples, the watermelon, strawberries, they obviously pollinate those plants and they keep on going. So if bees weren't there, we'd run out of those plants so we wouldn't get that food. Because they affect the crops that we eat, they also affect the crops that animals eat. So they also affect the animals that we eat. So they are very critical. And just to show you how much they've actually decreased over the years, because they have been decreasing at like a catastrophic rate, honey making companies who have thousands and thousands of hives spread over fields and things like that. Each year, they are now reporting a loss between 30 to 90% of their bee population. So some places are experiencing 90% losses. I'll get into the why in a second. Like there are a couple of reasons that we're trying to fight, but it's not looking good. <laughs> um, but yeah, 90%. And then, so just looking at the US alone, the number of hives in 1988 was 5 million across the US. And that in 2015 has now dropped to two and a half million. So there's half the amount of hives in just the US alone. And then obviously... It's, all, it's, it's a global thing, like they're being ruined in the UK, Asia, everywhere. And this is recently, only very recently, the last 10 years, it's now been sort of categorised and named, and it's a phenomenon called colony collapse disorder. There are a group of factors which they are certain are the causes, but they are still arguing about which one's actually doing the most damage and things like that and which one to tackle. So I'm just going to do a couple because I've realised time is going on, but I did actually think bees quite fascinating. Um, the biggest one is neonicotinides. <laughs> I got it out. I did it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it's a type of pesticide. And it's a pesticide where the chemical formula is very close to nicotine, hence the name neonicotinides. These are the most widely used insecticides in the world and they're developed in the 1990s and they kill insects by attacking the nervous system. And you, you think like, well, they surely they realise this. And yeah, no, when insecticides are being produced and then going through approval, they are tested on different animals and things like that to see the effects that might go on. And it was believed that they would be very, they wouldn't be very toxic to bees. It's just like the insects that actually kill things like, um, I actually don't know what that would be. What insects are bad for Caterpillars crops? Caterpillars and things, I think. Yeah, yes, yeah. So, um, yeah, God, you're so smart sometimes. So, <laughs> I don't know if that's true Just, or not. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be funny if it's not. Um, but so, they, yeah, they did actually think, uh, or whether they lied, because I'm going to get into a bit of a scandal in a second with it all. But they did believe that neonicotinides were very little toxicity to bees, and specifically the honeybee, the most important one. But what has been found, though, in the last five to 10 years from like independent research is that bees that come into contact with this type of pesticide uh, seem to get a sort of bee-like version of Alzheimer's, which is quite a sad thing that we're doing to them. And so th there's common symptoms where like they'll leave the hive or the home if they're like one of the uh, solitary kind of species, uh, but then they forget the way back and they just die out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, or they actually can forget how to fly and they just get stuck on the floor and then die like like really bad you Alzheimer's see them on the floor no that's well I don't know actually but when you see them on the floor it's mo it's mainly probably because they're resting and what you should do if you ever see a, a bee on the floor and it's not moving much or it's slowly walking pick it up and put it into a nearby flower so it can drink some nectar or if there's no flowers nearby which you think are like bee friendly or anything like that you can mix 50-50 water and sugar and leave it a little teaspoon for them and then let them drink it and then be on their way and they'll get their energy back. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's an Alzheimer bee on the floor or it's just a tired bee, but treat them with respect, guys. Treat them with respect. <laughs> We're all about positive messages here. We, and we care about the natural world. So Unless it's a European German black bee and then it's like, <laughs> yeah or, or the or the killer one yeah just get run away um <laughs> but for, yeah so from the work that I, from the bit of research that i did do 
there is a bit of a scandal in the background of the B world. Um, and obviously it actually makes complete sense because the insecticides and the specifically the neonicotinides, because they're the most widely used insecticide across the world. I just want to interject. I can't believe I'm hitting these words, to be honest, right now. <laughs> yeah, the scandal, obviously the billion dollar industry that are producing this. And so from their point of view, from a money-making point of view, they want to s- slow down the transition if we have to drop them as much as possible. And what's been really funny is it, um, if you look at studies that have been sponsored by the chemical industry, they seem to produce results that say there's not much harm to bees and it's all okay. But then when you look at independent researchers and university researchers who look at this stuff, it seems to be that these neonicotinides are like the worst toxic that you can get for bees. So, you know, a little bit of little bit of play going on there. So for ages, obviously, uh, overlooking bodies and governing bodies were seeing the research from the chemical companies themselves and like, oh, it's harmless, it's fine. But now all these independent research is coming out showing actually they lied or they cherry picked data. And it's actually very problematic. Um, one great thing is that in 2018, the, U- the EU did rule to stop the use of these pesticides in the whole entire EU. So that's very good. But a lot of people are worried that because of Brexit, we no longer have to follow that rule. And because it is a cheaper alternative with the insecticides way that we'll just go back to it. So we'll see what goes on with that. I was actually going to talk to you in depth about the other problems and the other contributing factors to their decline. Uh, Parasites is a big thing. They're seeing massive increases due to just due to global warming, just the general heat that they have, they can survive better and do really horrible things to them. And then also global warming. It's purely based is the biggest killer. I think from what I was reading, Uh, it's just because with the temperatures rising flowers bloom earlier, but now they, there was a very, very delicate balance between like the, uh, timings of bees and the timings of queen's pheromones to tell the bees to go out and do the pollination and collect nectar and those were very very in line with when plants would be blooming but now the plants are blooming that much earlier because of the temperature rise that the bees are late to the show and basically there's not enough nectar there's not enough pollen they're not pollinating as much so there's less flowers next year and they're also not collecting as much nectar so there's not as much food for the hives to actually eat and produce and things so it's just like things getting wiped out basically i think i'll end it there man that was i i have spoken for a long time um i mean i did receive i i did receive feedback saying you know I like they enjoy the topics and they sh- we should just run with it. So I'm just taking that full, full ahead, really. Positive <laughs> messages. Um, apart, well, the 2018 legislation about the insecticides, I think, is very, very good. And I hope the UK keeps to it, even though now after Brexit, we don't have to. And it will be, I, I presume they will have to vote on it if to follow it again or not. Um, but yeah, apart from. There are loads of charities trying to do work uh, and obviously anyone can have bees and you should try and plant flowers for the bees to have and promote their lifestyle <laughs> kind of things uh, in your local area. You know, even little, they love herbs, I read. Herbs are the biggest ones for them. I don't know why, but flat flowering herbs are like their favourite. So, you know, even if you've just got a pot on the windowsill with a flowery herb in it, that's great. That's, that's what I'm going to leave you guys with. Put a flowery herb pot on your windowsill, guys. Do, do the world look some good. Otherwise, you have no coffee in a couple of years' time. <laughs> there you go. I'm out. Mic drop. Over to you, well mate. Done. So my section today, I'm going to talk to you about plastics and kind of the truth behind recycling. You know, why we chose plastics, the double-edged sword of plastics. Ooh. Is the alternatives actually better than plastics? So hitting you with a lot of things at the beginning, a lot to think about. Mm, big episode so, this, I love it. Yeah. Should we just jump into it? So everyone uses plastic, right? So if you look around your room, them headphones on your head, it's got plastic in it. That microphone stand, got plastic in it. Like everything. Actually metal. <laughs> just, just to, yeah, just to be correct, it's actually metal. But well, I see the plastic. point you're trying yeah. to make. Okay. <laughs> so it's everywhere, but where did it originate from? That's what I'm gonna. I always start with a bit of a history lesson. How do oh, history's good. One of my favorite subjects. Do you know how? No, no clue. It might surprise <laughs> you. 
because you played this game a lot at university. It came from billiard balls or snooker balls or pool balls. Oh, I do. like. Oh, you have piqued my interest now, yes, sir. Yes, there you go. He's sitting up now. <laughs> so back in the 19th century, billiards or pool, it was kicking off. Like A lot of people liked to play it in like saloons and things in America. It was like played a lot. And what the balls were made from was actually ivory. And if you don't know, ivory is sourced from elephant trunks. Very bad. So what happened was... Humans doing what they do best, fucking shit up. Basically, we hunted, <laughs> we hunted the elephants to a point where demand really outdone the, the supply because the, the only supply we had was these elephants and we killed them all. So all the billiards supplier, they were offering cash rewards. So there was a, a $10,000 reward and back in the 19th century. So the 1800s, you know, this would have been like a few hundred thousand dollars for someone mm. to actually invent something that behave like one but could be produced without using ivory after a few episodes we've been doing this now yeah humans seem to be a big problem that we keep coming into <laughs> with the various topics yeah. <laughs> like we're really really not doing very good every topic that we come to the table with humans are fucking it up somehow oh it's like a bad thing with humans yeah anyway so in 1863 an american called John Wesley Hyatt, or however you say it, I don't know. Um, he took up the challenge. and Basically, in five years it took him, he made this new wow. material. It was called celluloid, and it was made from cellulose. So this was found in, like, wood and straw and things, and he made this ball from that cellulose. It turns out it wasn't actually very good for billiard balls because it wasn't heavy enough, didn't quite bounce right, but on top of that, it was highly explosive. So, so <laughs> picture yourself in a saloon in like old like America time. Okay, I'm two, there. Two of these balls hit into each other, explode. <laughs> and everyone thinks that someone's pulled out their gun and shot. So basically what was happening, all these men would bring out their pistols and like be pointing at everyone like, what's going It'd on? It'd be like a bar fight. <laughs> yeah, and it would just be because the balls were hitting each other and little explosions were happening because they were... They would wow. Yeah, so that's a funky little story. Anyway, so... That's why we like history on this channel. <laughs> so basically, what he produced was known as the first ever plastic. The word plastic basically can describe any material made of polymers, which are basically these large molecules consisting of the same repeating unit. In a nutshell, okay, polymer is poly, is many, and mers is unit, so many units. Mm. Fun little fact for you. Anyway, You're getting a little matter. science lesson now. Yeah. Plastic became such a thing because you could have so many different combinations of things to, to behave differently. Polystyrene, see it is strong, good for insulation, where vinyl, you know, like a, a vinyl for music, that's hard. Oh, yeah. Right, but, gotcha. But flexible, acrylic, transparent, also really strong. See, you yeah. are listing off different plastics. Yeah. Just like I was listing off the different bees. But basically the reason why it's so versatile and, and it's really easy to make once you get the kind of manufacturing process done. So when injection molding came about, it was like, well, why not just mm. use this over metal or something like that? But problem was, is that we never thought about what we were going to do with the plastic after. It's produced from oil. Most of the time it's designed for that single use. Now each year, they, one of the studies say there was 400 million tons of plastic produced and 40% of wow. that is just single-use plastic. So only be used once Jesus. before it's then binned. And some of these plastics take hundreds of years to, to decompose, mm. thousands, some of them. So like think everything you've used, when you go buy some chicken from the shop, it's in that plastic packaging. You've done that how many times in your life? And you, you put it in a bin, like think of how much plastic you get through mm. just that one it, time. It is crazy. It really is crazy. Another problem is that not all plastics can be recycled. Um, and this might be because the way they're made up or it's too expensive to do so. Some of the coffee cups, I don't know if you saw this, but they actually have a waterproof plastic lining in. Like, obviously, when you hold your coffee, you don't think, oh, this is cardboard. It should just make it all soggy. It's got this plastic <laughs> lining and it makes it really difficult to recycle. So then they end up getting thrown away. Every day, apparently, 7 million cardboard coffee cups are thrown away, but only one God. in 400 are recycled. What? Oh my lord. <laughs> Jesus like Christ. All these, all these coffee cups. And then obviously recently it's been brought to attention that 
this plastics getting found in the ocean. So it's quite a lot mm. on the news. I reckon 8 million tonnes of plastic go into the ocean every year. There was this fact that blew my mind, and it's basically experts think that by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean by weight than there are fish. Apparently each year as well, they estimate 100,000 animals in the sea are killed by plastic. Jesus Christ. So all over the world, we've Disgusting. got this basic, we've got this war on plastic now. Governments, campaigners, they're all in this effort to save the ocean, stop marine wildlife being harmed. You know, you see all these horrible pictures and videos and things. And to do that, we're being asked to use less and recycle more, which is obviously a good thing. Like you'd want that. But when I say use less, to use less, we need to use alternatives, right? Like mm-hmm. most of the time, instead of carrying a plastic bag, let's use this other bag and use it loads and loads of times because you mm. still need that use, right? So when you actually look at the alternatives, this is when stuff gets really crazy, right? I'm going to ask you, what what do you think is the worst, right? A normal plastic bag, a biodegradable bag, a paper bag, uh, one of the reusable bag for life things, or cotton tote bags. What do you think is the Which best? Which do I think is the best? Yeah. I think the cotton has to be the best. Okay. The single-use plastic bag has to be the worst, but surely... I'd hope. Okay. And then, to be fair, I would say the paper bag, second worst, and then the biodegradable one. And right. then the b- bag to life is, like, the second best because you keep it and you reuse it constantly. Like, those are the ones I used. Just keep so, on taking the same bags back to the shops. I think I'm going to surprise you quite a lot there. Oh, no. That's, okay, cool. <laughs> that's your thoughts, right? So I thought I was helping the environment, man. <laughs> so there's this thing called a lifetime assessment of Mm -hmm. a product so you look from how you produce it to how you how it's maintained then how it's broken down or whatever and if you look at normal bags they use oil and they obviously have this bad impact on the environment but when you look at other bags so the biodegradable you've got to think of carbon dioxide as well in this so we're thinking we're talking about global warming and the plastic problem at the same time Mm. because they're quite interlinked Mm. so the biodegradable bags they are made from plant starches and overall they produce similar amount of carbon um, as a plastic bag but you've got to think of the other additional effects so the agriculture that's involved in making them starches Mm. you know they require a lot of water a lot of fertilizer pesticides you know what you're saying about the bees oh yeah they'd also use that Mm. um that's looking just at a, a production standpoint they are worse than the plastic bags because they have all these other additional effects to it Okay. So right, gotcha. If we look okay. at the paper bag, we've got to then cut down the wood. Yeah. Find the trees, them cut low. them down. And it basically they estimate it was a similar climate impact as a normal bag. So right, bag. gotcha. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. why I put that one low. I'm happy I got that one right. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the reusable bags, these are also made from plastic. So oil, obviously not good. Mm-hmm. And they're thicker, so they need more of it. Mm-hmm. So it has a bigger impact. Um, obviously you're going to reuse it, but from a production standpoint, yeah, that's worse. They're also heavier, so you have to use more fuel to transport them. We're also all human. The amount of times we forget our bags for life and then end up buying another bag for life and then end up getting more than one bag for life. Yeah. Um, Yeah. They're they're not a puppy. It's a puppy, okay? You've got to keep that shit for life, not just for Christmas. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. And then the cotton tote bags, they seem like a green option. But growing cotton is actually extremely energy intensive. Um, is it? Oh, and it no. requires huge amounts of land, water, fertilizer, pesticides. Oh, God. And it's extremely carbon intensive. So, from a production standpoint, plastic is actually the best out of all of them. Okay. Sometimes hmm. paper edges that out, depending on what study you look at and what tree you cut from and all that stuff. Um, but the worst material by far is the cotton bags. Hmm. So, when actually just looking at the carbon dioxide footprint of it you need to reuse a paper bag and a biodegradable bag more than once to make it better than a plastic bag so the paper bag unlikely to use it more than once like often you just yeah use it put it in the recycling that's it done yeah yeah but just once did you say so like you just have to use it twice and it's still better than the plastic bag from a carbon dioxide standpoint yeah okay right so that's fine that's fine reusable you have to use about six times that's fine Mm. 
cotton tote bag, you have to use at least 149 times. Oh, wow. Okay. I was wrong so, on that one. <laughs> yeah, but that's just carbon dioxide. When you actually look at the total environmental impact, they, they go through these 15 categories, such as like toxicity, ozone effects, water demand, resource use, all these other things. The numbers are like crazy, right? So, right. Okay. In order to be greener in a total environmental impact way, you have to reuse the paper bag 43 times. Mm -hmm. Probably not going to be a bag after all that. (laughs) No, exactly. The biodegradable bag, 42 times. Okay. The reusable plastic bag, 54 times. And the cotton coat bag, the one that you say is the the best one, you have to (laughs) use 7,100 times. (laughs) Oh, wow. Okay, so essentially, if you use the same bag for life for a whole year, for a year's worth of weekly shops, you're near enough going to be okay. Yeah. That's that's the limit. That's the, same, the threshold. The same, one. Yeah. the same bag for life every single Saturday on your weekly shop for a whole year, and then you can get a new one, and then that's kind of like, okay. Yeah, I don't think humans are going to use the same bag for a whole year. No. It's just people I forget. That, like, yeah, yeah. I yeah, went to the shop yeah. today and I forgot a bag. I ended up having to carry everything because I refused to to buy. Yeah, to, to be fair, I was going to ask that. Did you look at all? It's like how things are changing because yeah, if I'm getting a few little things, I'll literally just carry them for like ten minutes home if if I can, rather than getting that one little bag. Or I do try. Or I put them in my rucksack uh, or like whatever bag I have on me at the time, kind of thing with like books or whatever rather yeah. than buying one of the plastic bags. So I do think but, like people do want to change. Yeah, people do, but it still doesn't stop you for that one time where you've got yeah. too much stuff that you need to carry. Anyway, I don't want to get stuck up on that. Just to show that, you know, these these ideas of, oh, it's better, it's greener option, isn't always the case. And Are you going to be telling us what the best one is then? Well, I, th- I think what we said is you can reuse oh. it. It's basically okay. reduce the plastic use as much as you can. There's a similar thing with straws. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but the plastic straw, it's got loads of bad press and everything. But the actual environmental, like people then got metal straws. So I own a metal straw. Mm. Uh, some people got glass straws. But the environmental impact mm. of making a metal straw, you know, you've got to melt the metal, you've got to form it, you've got to then transport it ends up being 37 times more impact than the plastic straw would have. And the only problem with the plastic straw is if it ends up in the ocean, really. If you could landfill it and you have the space and it can decompose over hundreds of years, then it's fine. Mm. But yeah, but then you see the horrible photos of like straws of turtle noses and things like well, that. Well, exactly. That's the problem. You know why we dump it into the ocean? Like who, who's, who's got a, who's at a meeting and said, there's a big problem with plastic where are we going to put it? Who's the guy who went, let's just, let's just chuck it in the ocean, mate. <laughs> like, there's lots of room there. It'll sink. It'll do, or it, and it doesn't sink. It just floats. But, you know, who the hell came up with that, that idea? It's hard because I'll tell you kind of where the plastic gets in the ocean and then you can start to point fingers and then it will actually surprise you. <laughs> so okay. this, this plastic, it's hard to dispose of, right? Ends up getting into the sea somehow. When I talk about the sea where it gets in the worst place that happens is in east asia china indonesia philippines vietnam and sri lanka and they're responsible for more than half of the world's plastic in the ocean so in comparison Mm -hmm. the uk ranks really really low if you put all the countries in the eu plus the uk with the coastline we'd be a combined 18th place in the world for putting plastic in the ocean the problem is i think the UK is very insignificant in this, really, when looking at them numbers. But say I have a plastic cup and I put it in the recycling, I'm assuming that cup is going to be recycled all the mm. time, right? Well, apparently in the UK, 42% of plastic waste gets recycled, 42% gets incinerated, and 13% gets buried in landfill, okay? But the right. 42% that we send for recycling, we don't have the facilities mm. in our country to actually recycle that amount. And it's much, much more expensive to do it here because we have to pay higher wages. So what do we do? We end up shipping it to them countries that have the worst plastic waste. So we ended up, in 2018, we shipped 611,000 tonnes of plastic. (laughs) 
so we can't yeah we can't say we're good on in this at all can we no so like all the like, it's our fault yeah. the plastic that's getting in the ocean is our plastic but we're just yeah pooing it somewhere else but china have actually recently banned that but malaysia still are taking it some of the countries are starting to think okay this isn't a good idea taking in all this rubbish because we're basically paying companies to take it for us mm-hmm. and the problem is once it leaves our shores we don't care that much to track where that goes it might end up yeah. in a recycling plant where it's they're saying that they're going to do it and it's fine but some of it ends up in the ocean it's sad because these places that are ch- chuck it in the ocean then are the places with like the nicest oceans <laughs> like yeah, the ones with like the coral reefs and things like <laughs> i'd rather do it in england with like just you know some crappy seaweed and some seals than like <laughs> where the turtles and all the corals live <laughs> but yeah, so these countries that we ship it to, uh, they're the worst equipped to actually deal with that rubbish. Like, right. if we dealt with it, we have the technology to sort it all out. We could recycle it, get better use out of it, but we don't do that. We ship it to people that they end up having beaches full of it, don't know what to do with mm. it, and then it ends up just getting washed away. So it's a positive feedback loop of crap, basically. Yeah, and it's not going to change until the government incentivizes people like the uk to do it and is there going to be money in that right now probably not mm. with everything that's happening mm. anyway so what happens to the rest of of the plastic so i said 42 percent gets incinerated and the uk government actually say that this is quite good because you can burn it and it acts as fuel you can generate electricity obviously it creates carbon emissions so then you're you're taking the plastic waste in the ocean and then giving up the whole global warming aspect because you're releasing all these emissions and things like that the other options the landfill People think, oh, no, you shouldn't do that. Like, it's a horrible... Like, whenever you picture a landfill, you're like, oh, no, this is bad. Uh, yeah, it ruins the aesthetic of a country, doesn't it? Yeah, but you can... If you landfill sensibly, where you line it all so none of the harmful toxins get out, uh, and you do it... Okay. Um, I actually didn't know there was, like, a good way to landfill. I honestly just thought they chucked it somewhere altogether, no, they... and then the problem was it seeped into the soil. So they actually line... Oh, the, okay. The landfill sites with plastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite quite ironic. Yeah. So, what else can we do in this? You know, the government has taken the stand of we want to try and reduce the amount of plastic we use. Seems like a really good idea, but then government policies don't really base it on good scientific advice or evidence or anything. So, to so the plastic straws. We know that they can be damaging to the marine wildlife. And I think we've actually banned them now in the UK. Like people can't, you can't buy a plastic straw from like a bar or something. But, yeah, because McDonald's had that big thing, didn't they? Yeah, and they've got plastic uh, paper straws now. Yeah. But where does that paper straw come from? It comes from a tree, <laughs> you know. <laughs> what a thing. <laughs> anyway, so by the estimates, there was 47 million straws every year being produced. The government reckoned that was one percent was getting in the ocean. One percent. Oh my god! But that one percent was provided with no calculations, no proof, no scientific evidence. Oh. It was just based on assumption. They were basically saying we assume okay. that one percent will get into the ocean. But you know what I said before about if we could recycle in the country, how is it going to get into the ocean? Apart from the few people that are dicks and throw straws in mm. the ocean, if we did it here, it wouldn't be a problem. No, you'd be able to actually have strong figures. Yeah, and you wouldn't, like, the only reason it's getting in the ocean is because we're offloading it all to these countries that can't handle the rubbish, and then it ends up getting in the ocean. So it kind of, obviously it's a good thing that we ban straws because they will somehow get to the (laughs) the ocean, and it's bad. But the whole policy of us shipping our rubbish, you know, we talk about straws, but what about plastic bags? They're not banned yet. All the other plastic stuff, which will still end up in the ocean, which will probably do a lot more damage than a single straw would. Is a paper bag better to go in the ocean? Because I feel like that might just like disintegrate away better than like obviously a plastic or like a paper straw. The fact that we move to those, yeah. they would like more disintegrate in the ocean. You assume that they would get soggy and then end up just breaking up. Yeah. There's a thing with like paper straws, right? I don't know about you, but if you have a drink and you haven't finished it, you end up having to get another paper straw. Oh, they're crap, yeah. Yeah, so like they get (laughs) soggy, you can't end up drinking it. Yeah. You have to get another one. Now, I've already said like the carbon footprint of making a straw is already worse than the plastic. Now you're using two of them for that one. 
Mm. So it's a much it's it's that balance of, you know, we can ban ban plastic, but is the climate change side of that going to be worse or better? Because you're right, yeah, you know, it's still bad. We're using oil and fossil fuels to make these things. So, Toby, what is the solution? I hope you've come up with a new chemical to solve all of our problems. <laughs> That's so, kind of what I'm expecting. If you go on the Not So Alpha Males Instagram, you can find our new plastic product, which doesn't <laughs> use any plastic. <laughs> but no, it, my, my conclusion is that the war on plastic isn't simple. It's very complicated. Mm. And using alternatives is a good thing but you need to make sure that the alternative isn't actually worse than the plastic itself because it's just it might be a, a pr kind of stunt oh get this cotton bag and it might look like it's environmentally friendly but where did that cotton come from how did, how was it mo- made and stuff like that and by solving the problem with the plastic in the sea which is obviously a massive problem might then offset that with all the problems with climate change because you're putting it out all this more carbon and everything so yeah, that's. I'm going to finish on that. Not a high, not a low. Just no. what the fuck do we do? Thank you and <laughs> good night. <laughs> <laughs> well, we might not have to worry about it for much longer because if there's no bees left, we're going to die. And, you True. know, as Albert Einstein said, four years, it doesn't matter, mate. Say. He didn't say. He, but he didn't say. But he didn't say. G- uh, glad you're listening to me. There you go. <laughs> Proof. No, it's an interesting one, the plastics. So essentially, we should just all not use as much and try to use what we do use multiple times. Lots to think about, no answers. Hopefully people solve it soon. <laughs> That's basically what we bring to the audience of this podcast. No answers, just a lot of things to think about, though. We'll highlight the problems and expect other people to find the solutions. That's how we roll. Exactly. I like it. What was your Irish cocktail cactus like? <laughs> it's not really a cocktail if any it's just a strong baileys to be honest but it was quite nice but it is just drinking a strong baileys so i'd recommend it but it's not really like a out there summer tropical cocktail next week's will be better how about yours uh my face is red so i don't know if that's the oh yeah christ i'm starting sorry i've not been watching you trying to work (laughs) out if i should like yell for your mom or something (laughs) Hope she's got hay fever for my mum. <laughs> Cheers for that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and on that sorry note, thanks everyone for listening. Be a, follow us on Instagram and everything. And we'll see you soon. See you later. <laughs> see you soon, guys.